The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to this week's show. So glad you could join. One of the topics that we've brought up multiple times here on the show is about really thinking deeply about unintended consequences. The ideas, the inventions, the things that we're inventing, we think we understand their positive impact and why people would want to buy them and why we're excited about inventing them. But the real question is, is is there an unintended consequence? Is there a long-term consequence that we should consider when we are working on these innovations? Now, Multiple shows I've covered this and shared with you my thoughts. This week, however, I am bringing somebody onto the show who I highly respect, who's recently put out a very exciting book uh, that uh, uh, that I've been reading, and I invited him onto the show. This week's guest is Chunka Moy. Chunka is a very well-known futurist. Chunka and I actually worked for the same corporation. We didn't work in the same division, but we knew of each other and had uh, run into each other uh, just once or twice uh, back in the early 90s when we both worked for uh, Computer Sciences Corporation. Chunka worked for Vanguard at CSC, and I worked in, in a telecom. I was in the part of the telecom group at CSC. Uh, but Chunk has always been, as long as I've known him, been very focused on thinking about the future, how companies can take advantage of exponential technologies. But nowadays, his thoughts are more about that those long-range changes that we need to be thinking about that are going to have societal impact and also leaving a legacy. What happens after we are gone? This interview is was... Uh, very exciting for me to get caught up with Chonka. I've been, he sent me his book. I've been reading it. Love it. Uh, so we had a great conversation, recorded it. That's what makes up to this week's uh, episode. And Chonka graciously has made a very special offer for you, the listener, for you to be able to get a free copy of his book. Now, I think this is Chunka's fifth, sixth, seventh. I've lost track. The guy writes books like like crazy, and you should read all of his books. But in this case, his book, A Brief History of a Perfect Future, is one that was inspired by his daughter to, for us in the older generation, to not screw up their future. And that was the inspiration for this book. Very inspirational book. Open opens your eyes to think differently about the future and your role as an innovator. So you are going to want to stay engaged through the entire interview. And at, towards the end, Chunka will share with you on how you can get your free copy, uh, no charge, for his book. So with that, before we jump into this week's episode, got that favor to ask. Follow, like, and share. Follow us on social media. Like us, give us a rating, thumbs up, wherever you get your podcast from, and then share it with others. And without further ado, this let's jump into this week's episode. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Chanka, thanks for joining the show today. You and I worked, I guess, at the same company way back in the 90s at Computer Sciences Corporation, met, you know, once or twice, but really didn't get a chance to know each other. But then our paths have always kind of like somewhat crossed and, and come back. I mean, 
you recently put out a uh, yet a new book in your portfolio. I've only got one out. I can't even face getting the second book out yet at this point. <laughs> and you and you've got multiple outs. So I'm in all of that. But your new book, A Brief History of a Perfect Future, is is and you were gracious enough to send it to me to to read, and I loved it. And I think uh, I think I thought it was an interesting area, and that's what we want to talk about today. But before we jump into the book, give me a little bit of background. What have you been up to most recently? Oh, you know, I'm one of those crazy characters that's trying to change the world, so I'm up to that. <laughs> and um, much of the book is about those those parts of the industry uh, that I that I work in, and those kinds of problems that I think about. And um, what I'm really up to is trying to get uh, brilliant people like you and the and your audience to think about long term problems and the kind of impact we can have on. Well, the thing that I really, and, and this was even back when you were at CSC Vanguard, and CSC Vanguard, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, was, I guess the best way I always described it was, it was kind of a a futurist advisory kind of a view, right? It was to help senior executives think about the future, because most executives don't spend enough time thinking beyond the quarterly results or maybe the annual report. And that's what I always loved about Vanguard was that strategy of hot, you know, get out of your day to day and think about and, th- and think about the future. And your book picks up on that from the standpoint, though, a little differently in the fact that, you know, look, <clears throat> you know, you know, that was back in the 90s. Right now, you know, we're 30 years beyond that. And, you know, as I remind my grandkids last night, they took me out for Father's Day was I've got more years behind me than I have in front of me. And it's interesting when you kind of cross that line, you start thinking about the legacy. What do you leave behind? What's the results? And are you going to have an impact? And that's what I loved about the book, which was design. Don't, 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 don't let the future be an accident. Think long, deep, and hard about that legacy and the future you are going to leave behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when we, when we looked at, the intersection of emerging technologies and strategy in that Vanguard program. In the early days of the internet, um, we made a very sort of basic uh, assertion, right? That technology is changing exponentially, whereas the organizations we're working with were designed to change incrementally. And if you really want to think about innovation, you have to think about what's possible on an exponential curve as opposed to what you want to do on on that incremental curve. So I spent the first 20 years of my career thinking about, okay, what do organizations, how do they capture that exponential technology to innovate inside their organizations? This phase of my career is about the same thing really, but not about individual organizations, but us collectively, right? Because for the last 50 years, information technology has been growing exponentially like that. And it's been pulling along all these other sort of related technologies, as we write about in the book, like genomics and energy and water and transportation, all on this exponential curve. And society is changing very, very incrementally. And sometimes we're even fighting change at that level. But if you think about what you want to legacy you want to leave behind, or even what impact you want to have on your children's lives, your grandchildren's lives, the question then is, okay, What's possible? What, what's possible in that long-term time frame, given that exponential growth? And that's what this book is about. Well, and when you look at like the the doubling effect, right? The the logarithmic scales of, of technologies, this exponential curve. <clears throat> Many people in the technology world believe that it just is what it is. And that you can't move the curve. You can't shift the curve. You can't change the curve. That we're almost victims to it. And I don't buy into that. I don't know what your thoughts are, but I don't buy into it. I I, I think actually when, and I think in the case of many innovators, we don't spend enough time thinking about unintended consequences. We get tied up in the shiny good, you know, isn't this really cool? And then all of a sudden we put something out there and you go, "Uh oh, didn't think about that. <laughs> yes, That's well, going to have a negative impact. And 
you've set off yet your own curve that takes off and that you can't claw back. You can't, you know, you, it, you release something that has a negative impact. And we can talk about, you know, whether that's, you know, we're, we're living this today with the environmental yeah. issues and with the global warming and, you know, Colorado, we're sitting here, you know, now in a, in a, I just got my notice three days ago on water restrictions now in Colorado, you know, because of the drought situation. And now, you know, the Boulder fire and all the, all the other issues. And then you go yeah. back and you think, Hmm, could we have changed the, if we caught it early enough, could we have changed the curve? Yeah. Well, you know, there, that's a, that's a really smart observation there. And there's a lot of different parts to unpack there. I think we don't spend enough time thinking about unintended consequences and we need to take more responsibility for that as innovators and inventors. But I also think we actually don't spend enough time thinking about the intended consequences. Um, you okay. Know, that, not, 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 that is, not, not, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think that, you know, we, we are clearly driven by sort of quarterly and annually, annual sort of returns and market cycles. I don't think we think long, long, hard enough about what do we want in the long term, right? Um, what, what the question we ask in the book is, what do we be given these technology cycles, which I sort of believe are sort of inevitable, right? Because there's all these mechanisms driving them forward, but what we do with them is not inevitable. Right. These are tools, these are amplifiers to both good and evil, good intentions, bad intentions, benign intentions. Right. So the question we ask in the book is, if you take a long enough time frame, what would it be, what would it be crazy not to have given these capabilities that are going to exist? What would it be crazy not to have? And can we work backwards from that goal, that future goal, and design our intentionally design our pathway to that as opposed to just sort of letting it happen. Hmm. Yeah. So do you have an opinion then around, cause you talked a little bit about, you know, we kind of are taking this, these short terms. We don't think about what, you know, we don't plan for the intended long term. You know, I've always argued against the, the whole wall street quarterly 10 Q force leaders to make short-term decisions and not think about the long-term. Is that, is, do you think that's valid or do you think it's a cop-out? You know, do we just blame Wall Street because, look, I got to make my quarterly numbers, so I've got to make this decision. And then you stack all these things up and end up at a bad outcome versus thinking strategically long-term. You know I'm happy to blame Wall Street, but I think they're only part of the blame. I think we have to blame ourselves. Right. Because where we choose to focus our energies, and you and I talk about, talked about this before this broadcast, you talk about a lot uh, in, in your podcast about, okay, um, how do we innovate? What's the time frame for innovation? And when do you invest in that? And do you carve out enough of your attention to invest in the long term? Not just for you know, social good, but for, for business good. Right. The, the um, your most recent um, well, one of your recent um, uh, newsletters talks about, you know, how do you invest in times of recession and how when organizations cut in the midst of recess recession, they actually lose the long term competitive advantage. And I'm just expanding that that much further. I'll give you an example. You know, the example we write about the book you're familiar with. Some of your audience might be familiar with as well. Right. When the folks at Xerox Park formed in the, in, the, in the early 70s, and they looked at the technological capabilities of, of, of the transistor and computing, they didn't ask, how do we build a better mainframe, right? Because mainframes were dominant at the time. They said, what new problems can we solve? And they, what new users can we capture? And they started thinking about kids and the, the applicability of, of technology to education. And then they didn't say just, okay, how do we build a better mainframe for kids? They said, okay, what's the whole environment that needs to surround this technological capability in order to meet that need for kids? Things like, you know, operating systems to interact with kids, um, object owner programming, user, you know, user, uh, uh, graphical user interfaces. They invented that because of that. 
right? They decide, they say, what kind of programming languages do we need? What kind of applications do we need? And, and you know, things like laser printers and PostScript and, and Word and, you know, came out of that kind of, that kind of capability because they took that technology and reimagined what kind of problem could be solved, right? And they created and user computing. They did, they did all the things that we look at today and say, wow, that's so obvious, but it was certainly not obvious at the time. Mm-hmm. And, and it also created, you know, trillions of dollars of market value. But the hundreds of billions of which were captured by Xerox, but others got up, you know. Well, that's it. Just right. The, the, the situation here is Xerox did all this work at Xerox Park, developed all this technology, but could not translate it into a product yeah. or tr- translate it into success. Um, I, I, and, actually, I and think now that's you... an urban myth. I think that's an urban myth that's that's not quite right because Gary Starkwater, the the inventor of the laser printer. Actually, ran out to Xerox Park because nobody at Kodak headquarters wanted to work on. I'm at Xerox headquarters wanted to work on the laser printer, and he made it working. And the reason he made it working, working with the other researchers at at Park, was because they needed an output device for the Alto. Right. So laser printers, PostScript, and hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue came to Xerox. Now they could have certainly done a lot better. Right, uh, but they actually got paid back for Xerox, Xerox Park many thousands of times over yeah, because of that one. I do agree with that, you know, and, the, and then the laser printer with Canon jumping in on it, and the Canon engine, which then HP used, and it's early, right? So you had this whole trickle down effect. But but if, what it is what it is interesting as a mental exercise is though is a lot of the other work, like what Alan Kay was doing there at Xerox, what Bernardo Huberman was doing there at Xerox, right? Couldn't translate because the Xerox people were just so focused on what Xerox is and anything outside the Xerox box. Yes. Laser printers fit in the box. All these other things fit outside the box and they couldn't figure out how to change the box. They kind of got... You know, they had this established box. And I think that's where a lot of organizations are challenged. You know, once I've got a core product and I'm, I've am got a successful business, I kind of stay in my box. Stretching beyond yes. the box is really, really hard. It's, you mentioned Alan Kay. Actually, a story by Alan is the driving narrative of our book, right? It, it, it comes from a time when Xerox executives kept on asking him and the other folks at Xerox Park, you know, to look into their crystal ball and tell them what the future of their business would look like. <laughs> and one day, as he tells me the story, he says, he just got really angry and said, look, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that is the narrative of this book where we ask the, the readers to say, okay, here are the, here are the <laughs> fundamental sort of exponential curves that we think are going to drive for the next 23 years. Computing, communications, information, genomics, energy, water, transportation, all on exponential curves. Capabilities in 20 years, we look back on today, will be, it'll be, they won't be infinite, but they'll, they'll be near infinite. Relative costs won't be zero, but near zero compared to today. You have this immense amount of tools, right? What kind of future can we invent? Given that technological capability, what would it be ridiculous not to have in areas like electricity and transportation and healthcare and climate, right? In trust in government. Um, and we think that if you sort of assume that gap and allow yourself to step out of today's world and ask yourself, what could you have? That gives you a North Star to work back to today and make choices that you otherwise may not make. Mm-hmm. So, if Xerox at the time could imagine an information ecosystem that was completely different than the office, they could have rationalized making interim decisions towards that. But as you say, they, they couldn't get out of this box. And much of this book is about giving people enough tools to get out of this box and saying, hey, that big box, whether you want to think about it from a personal or a professional standpoint, could be really big, you know, and really, really a golden age for, for innovation. Well, I would also argue, though, that it's in the cases of what you're trying to bring up in the book are societal 
it's the societal box. It's not a Xerox box or an HP box or a CSC box. You know, think about all the individual yes. entities. These are like really big problems that are going to require like a lot align. I shouldn't say alignment, but a willingness of our our innovation leaders to to really think about them and impact them. Right? You know, one you know, no one person, not even Al Gore, is going to change the the environmental equation. Right? Uh, it it's going to take it takes a broader set of people. Talk about the Alan K story here. You know, Alan worked at HP Labs, right? And I was in a meeting um, with Alan when he was working with, we were working with a bunch of young, you know, younger engineers. And everybody was really quiet because it's Alan K, right? Nobody wants to say anything. And Alan finally stands up and goes, look, I'll give you 10 IQ point credit for having an opinion. <laughs> Just have an opinion. Don't, don't, don't parrot what everybody else is saying. And I think that's, I think your book does a phenomenal job. Not just, it's not a random opinion, but it, it's a perspective that's a rallying cry, I think, for people yeah. to say, think differently. Go back to the Apple ad. Think differently. Don't get caught in the rut of just how we've always done it and all oh, things will get better. We, we, we need to be actively engaged to make a better future. You know, not just let the future happen, be the result of some accidental decisions in the past. Absolutely. And we have we have these incredible tools, um, you know, that are a product of human ingenuity at our, at our disposal. And we're already seeing that these tools can be dangerous. They can be powerful and they can be dangerous. But there are amplifiers. They're amplifiers to our choices. So what are those? Um, so what, give me an example. When you when you say a tool, what do you mean? Well, let's take a look at the pandemic and, and the fact that, you know, we had this miraculous um, innova innovation surge around vaccines and, and, and drugs. I mean, that's built on a, uh, a core capability around genomics that we've been developed for the last 20 years. Right? In the last 20 years, the cost of, human, of, of sequencing human genome has dropped by a factor of a million. And the speed with which to do it has increased by a factor of a million, right? 20 years. If this pandemic had happened 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to create the vaccines. We wouldn't have been able to even sequence and, and identify the, uh, the virus. Those are, when I say tools, those are the mm -hmm. sort of building blocks that we have. But as we say in the book, the building blocks aren't the building, right? What we choose to make of these, the same thing, you know, when we look at the, uh, the, the advances in uh, in solar and and renewables and the and the, and the dropping costs, or the advances in transportation technology and a potential dropping costs, all those are building blocks. Now, I think all those are building blocks around the pro problem of climate. They're also building blocks around healthcare and transportation and energy. Um, so, we have this opportunity to apply these capabilities to these very big problems, problems like climate change, like poverty, like healthcare. And we could actually, you know, um, create a very, very much more hopeful set of scenarios than, than a lot of people look at out there and say, well, what are we going to do about that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, let's talk a little, I mean, one of the things I've, that you have in the book is you've identified a number of these areas where, uh, we're seeing these 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 growth transportation being one as an example. You know, we could spend probably we could probably run all, an eight hour webinar on, on all of them, but pick one or two. What do you think are some of the more pressing ones, and how should we think about them? Well, I think the existential one is climate, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think if you look at twenty fifty, it's it's the year that we sort of point to and say. You know, we actually have to do something really um, amazing by that, or you know, things are not going to be so 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 good. And if you look at the capabilities we have in energy, capabilities that we have in computing and information, it would actually be crazy, right, if we didn't significantly slow global warming and mitigate the worst effects of climate change by 2050. And there's a lot of there's a lot of technology to help us do that. I mean, there's there's uh, advances in electricity, advances in net zero electricity, 
advances, event, uh, advances in efficiency, you know, advances in a whole range of industrial approaches that we have to essentially scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, how, and the way we do that is going to require a combination of individual, corporate, and government action. Mm-hmm. Um, many of your audience, you know, senior executives and governments, I would say to them that the next 30 years is a golden opportunity, probably the largest, most significant business opportunity of our lifetimes because of the need to react to, to the climate problem. So, for example, the only reason, the only reason why Elon Musk is the richest person in the world and Tesla is worth essentially more than the rest of the automotive industry combined is because we look at it as a potential opportunity to address climate. Now, it's a good car, right? but it also happens to be sort of the leading vehicle for the transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. That's an example of how I think climate action is going gonna, is gonna to affect, drive the business prospects of almost every company, right? Your ability to transition your products, your ability to speak to consumers, your ability to take advantage you know, of, of this existential shift in the market. Well, here's an interesting one, right? Because you're right. I mean, and... I've been fortunate to have spent a fair amount of time with Elon over the years, right? Guy's absolutely brilliant. And he gets what I would call um, an innovation premium to the share price, right? Because of, of, of how, the, how Tesla's viewed. At the same time, you see a lot of companies out there trying to do greenwashing. You know, they're trying to claim the, that, they're, that they're, like, they're like Elon or they're like Tesla. And you peel back the veneer and you're like, uh, no, you're not. You're just, you know, yeah. you're trying to go for that innovation premium without putting the work in to being really a transformative company that is part of the solution, not just trying to uh, drive awareness. Absolutely. Well, you know, um, Elon ships product. He doesn't ship uh, press releases. Right. Actually, he does good on press he, releases he, too. He, Twitter actually, releases. He, he ships. He ships tweets. Let's. <laughs> he ships tweets. But he also ships. You know, ships product. You know, the reason, if if it weren't for climate, it would be an interesting car. Right. But because of climate, we have to essentially go from four uh, percent market share for electric vehicles to almost a hundred percent. Right. Because we have to. If you believe in climate change and you believe in the transition. Right, the need to get rid of internal combustion engines. Imagine being an industry that in the next uh, 13 years has to go from 4% to 100%. Do you want to be making products in the declining path of that shift or in the, in the rising path? Right? This is why General Motors says they're, gonna, they're going to stop selling internal combustion uh, vehicles by 2035. Because if you look at the numbers, in order for us to get rid of, you know, the, the, the effects of climate due to internal combustion engines by 2050, it takes about 15 years to, to, for the cars to migrate out, for the rollover. So unless we stop selling internal combustion e- engines by 2035, we can't hit the 2050 timeframe. But if you look at the uh, emissions due to, due to uh, those cars, those light duty vehicles, it's only 8% of overall emissions, right? So if, if, we, if we get rid of all internal combustion engines, uh, they, they migrate out by 2050 or none of them, we still have 92% of the climate change problem left. And that 92% affects every other industry, right? So if, you know, if you're the person who perfects and scales zero carbon cement, you're gonna be richer than Elon Musk because there's a bigger market than cars. Same for steel, same, you know, same for carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, you know, we have to essentially transition every product to be electric, every product anywhere to be electric or uh, develop the carbon capture technologies to make up for the difference. So if you're, if you're the person who develops and scales carbon capture technology, you're going to be rich, richer than the rest of them combined and you'll be doing your, your kids and grandkids a, a service. Well, that's an interesting so, I, point because I think where a lot of people miss out and, and uh, 
uh, chief scientist at HP, Chandrakhan, always was harped on this. He did his PhD was in environmental sciences, brilliant scientist. And he developed a model that literally looked at the entire carbon footprint from raw materials through recycling, right? So how much did it cost to put the diesel into that Caterpillar tractor to mine the copper? How much did it cost to build the steel that went into the Caterpillar tractor? You know, right? Literally everything. And you're right. We're only solving 8 9% of the problem. But if you solve some of the fundamental problems, it also has the ability to improve that 8 to 9%. We all Absolutely. tend to focus on the 8 to 9, but you, you know, look, making lithium ion batteries, that's nasty stuff, right? And so is it, you know, how do we deal with that? Well, you got to deal with some of the fun, the, some of that fundamental industry stuff to have kind of the, the compounding effect. Right. And that's why I think that the opportunity is massive. And I don't want to get too hung up on the business aspects of this because it's a broader issue. But from a business standpoint, there's a great opportunity. So if you're, if for example, uh, you're in a data analytics, this problem of understanding full life cycle costs and development of, of, of products, that's an enormous data analytic, analytics opportunity. So I think that, you know, if you're in an area that's related to the climate action uh, challenge, then, then the innovation opportunities and the market demand is enormous. Now, is everybody going to win? No, but that's what innovation is all about, right? right? Bringing, out, bringing out the best solutions. And you could look at poverty. You could look at health care. You can look at transportation. I mean, all these are enormous societal problems, but also opportunities that we have to deal with. And I think one of the things that's driving this transition is that more and more of us are recognizing it. And even more importantly, investors are recognizing it, right? So do you want to be in the business of issuing a 30-year bond for a, um, you know, for, a, for a utility that's going to be sitting near the coast in Miami? No, <laughs> really, absolutely not. No, right? Because you know that, in that 30 year time frame, which that bond has to co- exist, um, things are going to look pretty bad. So, investors are going to start worrying more and more about that transition risk and transition costs, which will enable uh, executives like your audience to sort of have the leeway to start thinking about those long term economic issues. Okay. So, what do you say to the person that look, you know, reads, reads your book and then says, okay, this is just too overwhelming and I'm one person or one company, right? I, I, you know, how do I as one little person, one innovator, one inventor, one chief innovation officer at one company, this problem is just so massive. I, I, I'm going to get, I'm just, I'm just going to crawl into my cave and, (laughs) and wait. Well, if you're a chief innovation officer, the answer is easy. Uh, you look for the business opportunity. You, you say to yourself, given the, ca- the capabilities and competencies of this company in the context of this long-term business opportunity, what do we do? You know, what's, what's our long-term strategy and how much of our portfolio are we going to invest in thinking really big and starting small on, the, on potential products that address this capability? So as, a, as, you know, as an employee or as an executive, your challenge is to, you know, do well by doing good. Right. 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 As an individual, I think there's enormous opportunity. You know, there's, there's, you have a role as a citizen, right? Uh, who you vote for, what, what actions that you support and don't support. Your role as a consumer, right? Because innovation is not just about the supply side, it's about the demand side, right? So all those people who paid a premium for Tesla early, for whatever reason, help to drive on the cost curve. And you can do that for heat pumps. You can do that for, you know, um, veggie burgers. You can do that for Beyond Burgers. <laughs> whatever you choose as a consumer, right? Where are you going to put your voting with your pocketbook, right? As opposed to voting with your ballot. Investors. I mean, investors are key here, right? Because if we don't, if we don't invest for the long term, um, well, two things will happen. One is you lose your money in the long term. Because you know lots of values you know, get destroyed, uh, but but also you 
you give as an investor, whether it's about the right ESG fund or the betting or investing in the right company individually, you give that company long-term license to work on these problems or not. As an employee, you know, if you're not the chief innovation officer, where do you bring your talent? Right? Because the talent votes. Where does the talent go? Right? Do they, do they go on a company that's that's working on a real, real authentic uh, long-term strategy? Or are, they, or are they are they working for someone who has you know who, who is who is not, and then of course there's all of us as influencers as as you know, you know the folks who try to get uh, the, the these long term perspectives you know in front of everybody else. Yeah, it's, so it's, I think there's a lot of things in, individuals can do, and well, then the individuals and the companies affect of course government right because government is the third linchpin here on both the supply and demand side of innovation, right or wrong. Well, look, we're, we're, we're coming into this uh, yeah, economic uncertainty, right? You know, the argument is there going to be a recession or not, uh, et cetera. And we, we go through these economic cycles and have, you know, you, know you, you and I have lived around long enough. We've lived through, you know, a number of these, right? And, you know, I got younger staff and they're a little, get a little freaked out and I'm like, you know, look, 18, 24 months, it's going to be really, really painful, you know, but, you know, it will, will come out of it, right? I have confidence that, you know, the future's bright. Um, it, 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 but you can't sit on the sidelines, fold your arms and wait. And that's part of, I think, you know, the, the call to action from your book is don't be sitting on the sideline. Play an active role really in designing a perfect future don't wait for to be the, the beneficiary of it because we can all do something to contribute and if everybody contributes and if people help carry convince others to contribute you know to, to to engage on this then that has you start getting this this compounding effect and that's when real change happens absolutely absolutely i mean one thing we know is that we're not going to come out of if we have recessions shallow or deep uh, we're not going to come out of it the same. The business environment will be different. The the larger societal context will be different. So aim for that. Aim for the future and treat that as, you know, as an opportunity. Right. Well, and you talked about, you know, co consumers buying, right? This has always been the challenge when companies are trying to make a change because the products are actually more, you know, can be more expensive, right? You pay premium to get a Tesla in the early days, as your is the example you gave, right? And, but then you sit by and you go to the parking lot and what, look at all the cars parking into a Walmart where everybody buys on price, right? And that is a change that we can consciously make, right? What is your are you committed to, to being a participant in change versus continuing to pile on into the spiral? Right. Yeah. And it's a conscious decision. You do, you decide it's your choice. Nobody's going to force you, but you've got to choose. Yeah. Well, the, the, you, as a consumer, uh, you, you, you can make change by both what you buy and what you don't buy. Right. So maybe one of the, the key things is in our recession, what do we choose not to buy? Um, but yeah, yes. well, I was Absolutely. just having a conversation with some friends the other day about solar, right? And I had solar on my house in California and I, you know, with the, the cost of electricity in California is so much higher than other places. My payback period was like seven and a half years, right? You know, but you look at solar in other parts of the country where power is incredibly cheap. You know, it's 23, 24, 25 years to pay back on solar. Yet, every generation of solar panels is about every 15 years. So your refresh rate on the technology is slower than the, than the, the break-even rate on the cost to, to, to deploy. And that, I think, causes a lot of people to go, well, it doesn't make economic sense. Some cases it may not make economic sense. It's not about the economics. It's about that long term. It's that it's that longer term, as you said at the beginning. Look further out. Look beyond just the here and now and what that right. benefit is. Yeah. 
You know, the the we could, we could spend, as you said, uh, many many uh, hours on just the energy part. Um, I mean, essentially, energy. The answer is going to be uneven. I would say if solar is not economical in the area, don't buy it. Buy a heat pump instead. Right. Right. Or go um, geothermal. The big thing here in Colorado is geothermal. Is the is the big is the big right. thing here because it's cheaper cheaper and better return. <laughs> but but even just sort of wind, you know, strategy is all about the consideration set, right? Widening the scope of considerations to in, to encompass what do you do in the in this context? Because the other thing that Alan said was, you know, context is worth. 80 IQ points, mm-hmm. Alan K. that is, right? So widen in the context to the larger problem, widen in the context to, to the fact that you have agency is as a company or as an individual, you have agency, and then ask yourself, what do you want to do in that, you know, in that larger context? What can you do and what could you do and what do you want to do in that larger context? And are you actively working on it? Right, right. So talk a little bit more about the the book. Give give the listeners a little bit more context. And I'm going to encourage everybody, to, you got to read the book, but give a little bit broader context on, because the book got started by a challenge from your daughter, if I recall correctly, yes. right? So so the origin of the story of this book is, um, I'm, I come back from a conference um, you know, I speak a lot. I'm build build as a futurist. My daughters happens to see this cartoon they made of me in a in a in a spaceship, and she looks at it and said, "A oh, futurist, huh? Well, I hope you adults don't mess mine up." And she wasn't kidding, right? And and it really sort of whacked me on the side of the head, as you know, as eleven uh, year olds can do, and started me on this path to writing this book, which says, "Okay, let's think not just about these technologies in the context of." organizational success. Let's think about these t- technologies in the context of all of our successes. So we spend a lot of time asking the question of what would be crazy not to have in these key areas of uh, energy, of transportation, of healthcare, of climate action, of, of government, of trust. And what do these capabilities allow us to build if we, if we choose to? You know, we're not predicting the future. We write what we call future histories, histories of the futures that are possible, technologically uh, possible, and then sort of try to di- uh, try to build them out in a way that can excite the readers and get them interested. So if you're interested in any of these areas, I encourage you to read the book. And I'll make you an offer, Phil, just for your audience. If they send me an email, I'll send them the book for free. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to find me. Send me an email. Send me a message. I'll send you the book because I want you to think about how you can invent the future. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of this. Uh, I mean, it, it's a fantastic book, but I think it also it it does give us a pause about not getting so wound up in just our day to day and inventing the next, you know, slick laptop or whatever. But that we as innovators can really have a meaningful impact on what gets left behind for our kids or in my case, you know, I've got five grandkids. I'm focused on what, what's the legacy I'm living for my leaving for my five grandkids, you know, and is this a world I want to leave them or do I have uh, an opportunity to have um, a much broader impact? So, Chuck, if people want to keep track of what you're up to, where 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 is the best place to follow? I follow you everywhere, but I'll let you identify where where do they where can they keep up on on your appearances, your writings, etc. You can go to my website, chunkamoy.com, but the best place to follow me is probably on LinkedIn. I have a uh, buy with the newsletter there mm-hmm. um, that will keep people you know immersed in what I'm thinking. I apologize for that, but. That's what, that's what I try to do. <laughs> hey, that's great. Hey, 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 John, thanks a lot. It's great to catch up with you. It's been far too long. We'll have to have you uh, back on and at some other point. We'll take a broader topic of uh, just broader innovation. And that probably will turn into a two-hour episode. <laughs> <No way>. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I thanks a lot. It. Really appreciate it. So what'd you think? I am a big Chunkamoy fan. Uh, I think his view of the future, 
and his view of uh, what we need to be thinking about is something that we can all learn. As I said before in the intro, uh, you should go check out all of his books, not just uh, his most recent one, A Brief History of a Perfect Future. But that particular book is one that you should go out and get. Chunk has made an offer to make it free to all listeners of the podcast. Go over and find him over on LinkedIn. We can. We will also put the link in the show notes, so that way then you know how to get a hold of him. Uh, but uh, go get that book, read up on it. And the question I have for you is, is so what are you going to do? Are you just going to sit back and be passive? If you are in an innovation leadership role within your organization, how are you going to get your executives to think about your individual organization's role in establishing what this future, what this perfect future should look like or could look like? One thought is share the podcast with them. Let them listen in to, to chunk his thoughts and Give them the book also. Show them how to get the, a free copy of the book so that they can read it and they can understand. Let's turn this into a movement. Let's get the word out. Because as innovators, we provide a key leadership role to the global society about what a future could look like, what the future should look like, what kind of legacy do we want to leave for our kids and our grandkids? So don't just say, wow, interesting episode of the show and move on to the next episode. Take action. What are you, you, you as an individual, what are you going to do about it? It's a choice. The choice you can make, you can choice, choose to ignore it, but that's a choice if you choose not to take any action. Take action. What is it your organization, your industry, your community, your neighbors, what is it you're going to do to influence given your uh, position uh, as an innovator, whether you're a lone innovator working in your garage or you're a chief innovation officer at a multinational or you're an inventor, a technologist, an artist, a creative, whatever role you play, that Human ingenuity, that human creativity you have in you is unique. Take advantage of it and be a leader. So with that, thanks for listening to this week's show. Hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to find other guests, Summer to Chunka, to bring on to the show to challenge us, force us to think a little bit differently. If you've come across somebody that you heard, whether it was on YouTube or another podcast, and you think the listeners here at Killer Innovations would benefit from it, drop me a note, phil at killerinnovations.com, or you can post it as a comment over in the show notes. Um, wherever, However you want to get the message to us, we will reach out to that, that person and uh, see if we can not uh, get them interested in coming on to the show. So, again, thanks for taking the time. Time is your most valuable asset. Um, as you know, we're now in season 18. Uh, we're coming into the summer time frame here in, uh, in the U S I'm, we'll be taking some time off, but we, we, we will be working hard to keep the shows up. We pride ourselves on producing 45 to 50 unique episodes each and every year. And we've done that for the, uh, the lifetime of the, of the show. And again, we're Hard to believe, season 18. Um, So if you've got topics, questions, themes, um, anything that you would like to get answered, you never know. We could turn that into an upcoming episode of the show. Love to hear from you. So drop me a note. Let me know. And with that, have a great week. Make that decision. What are you going to do as the first next step based on today's episode? And also, work on that idea. That idea that's rattling around your head, that's in your idea notebook, that's on that index card, that's on that whiteboard next to your desk. What are you going to do about it? You're just going to leave it sitting there or are you going to take action? It's your call. You have an opportunity to change the world for the better. Go do it. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. 
podcasting nonstop since 2005. This has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.